Good morning, brothers and sisters, and happy Sabbath. As we begin our study, and I apologize for the lateness of the hour, let us ask our Heavenly Father for his guidance and his direction. There is much to be seen in this document, much that relates to all that we have been studying from the book of Zechariah. So we sh shall we seek our Heavenly Father's guidance as we open these words and seek to be taught of that which he would have us to understand. Shall we pray? Loving Father in heaven, we thank you for your great blessings. We thank you for your guidance and for your direction in all things. We praise you for that which has been ongoing. Direct us now, Father. Guide us in the path that you would have us to walk. Be with us now and always. Help us to do that which you would have us to do. Father, we thank you. For we know that when trials come, when difficulties arise, that you are there with us, that you are beside us and showing us that which we need. Help us that we may learn to praise you in all things. Be with us now. Direct us, we ask. May your angels attend us. May your spirit enlighten our minds. May we be hidden behind your cross so that as we come in contact with others, we may show your character alone. For this, we praise you and thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, as we have been studying over the last several weeks, we are now in the fourth book of the book of Zechariah. As you can see, this manuscript is a non-published manuscript where only portions of it had been published before. And it was published in 1897. As Mrs. White wrote, this morning, October 3rd, 1897, I was unable to speak, sleep past two o'clock. I am anxious to relieve my mind by writing. I would speak of those in whom the word of God has wrought decided reformation in life and character in accordance with divine precepts. These have obtained a personal experience and the knowledge that they will carry with them into the future immortal life. What is she saying in these brief sentences? Well, she's speaking to those that have chosen to follow God, have made changes in their lives, and uh, that the experience that they have will uh, be eternal. Is this not the experience that we need today? Mm -hmm. The word of God is to be our food. I am the bread of life, Christ said. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. John 6, 35. The world is perishing for want of truth, pure, unadulterated truth. Christ is the truth. His words are truth, and they have a greater value and a deeper significance than appear on the surface. All All the sayings of Christ have a value beyond their unpretending appearance. <clears throat> Minds that are quickened by the Holy Spirit will discern the value of these sayings. And by being anointed with the sacred salve, the eye of the mind can de detect the precious gems of truth, though they may be buried treasure. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> now, what is the sacred salve?
Well, that, this is the I salve in uh, the message to the Laodiceans. So is this a literal I salve? Well, no. Because we do not have an eye of the mind unless we are spiritually attuned, right? <clears throat> this is this is something that we need to address. We need to be able to understand. We are the ones to which the admonition of the Laodiceans are presented. Now, as it has been stated in the chat, this document was written around the time of the Tennessee Centennial Fair, a large celebration in Nashville. So this document is being written on behalf of the Laodiceans and has a connection with Nashville and the warnings to Nashville. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what were the dates of the World Fair? I know it was six months, and I'm trying to remember. Okay. Uh, when it ended. I think that one was from May 1st to October 30th. It seemed like a huge pagan celebration. The whole lot of states and different companies had had their whatever their showcase there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think that's the case. I think it didn't go to the thirty first, just to the thirtieth of October. So anyway, it's in that last month that she right. <clears throat> that she writes this. Now it, it says that she's she's writing October third. Um, but then, you know, it has the date of it is November 23rd of the document. Right. I'm not sure why that is. That could be, could that be the date that it was filed, the date that, you know, some of this was published? I don't know. Well, it, it's unpublished, so none right. of it was published then. I just don't know why there's the two different dates. Okay. And maybe I'll find we find as we read through it or something, but okay, consider this. How many days are there from October third, eighteen ninety seven to November twenty third? Um well there would be uh fifty fifty one. There's 31 in, uh, in October, so you would add 31 plus 20, so 51. Well, if, depending on, on the count that we would use, we'd either have 50 or 51 days. Well, you wouldn't have 50 because there's 31 days in October, so it's either 51 or 52 if you count it inclusively. All right. So as she continues, how needful for all who are workers in the cause of God to ponder these things, that they may guard against self-sufficiency. If men are self-sufficient, the Lord leaves them to their own human wisdom. We are not to trust in self, or to make a god of self. I must speak to our people. Pride, selfishness, and all desire for self-exaltation places human agents in a position where the Holy Spirit cannot work with them. In no case can the Holy Spirit cooperate with the methods and the plans of self-sufficient men. It is not for any to seek to be great speakers or preachers. <clears throat> to be wonderful evangelists. All who realize the dignity and the elevated character of the message they bear will hide in Christ. 
their security and efficiency comes from God. Here again, I cannot point a finger, for there are three pointed back at me. She is speaking for us today. She is speaking to us today. Now, consider carefully this next, this next paragraph. All, high or low, if they are unconverted to Christ, are on one common platform. Men may work themselves into the grave by abusing the human machinery. They may turn from one doctrine to another, this being done and will be done. Papists may charge, excuse me, papists may change from Catholicism to Protestantism, yet they may know nothing of the meaning of the words, a new heart I will give to thee, Ezekiel 36, 26. Accepting new theories alone does not bring any new life into the soul, even though the church with which they unite may be founded on the true foundation. A connection with the church does not take the place of conversion. To subscribe the name to a church creed is not of the least value to anyone if the heart is not truly changed. What should this say to us? We cannot afford to be Seventh-day Adventists in name only. We cannot afford to subscribe to the theories, the ideas of the world. We need to know more Bible truth and less of man's devisings. Well, the thing here, what this says to me, I mean, people can join this movement. They can believe the 2520. Uh, they can accept July 18th. Um, but none of that takes the place of conversion. It's not just a theory and an understanding of the truth that makes a person a Christian. And... You know, it, orthodoxy in thought does not equal uh, conversion. But lots of times we can be intellectually converted, uh, but all for the wrong reason. Right. So, I mean, this is a struggle all of us face. Right? It's just knowing the truth. And we see it around us, people who can profess to believe the truth, and yet act in a very unchristlike way but we can also see it in ourselves right that you know we have a theory of the truth but the truth doesn't actually change us and the more we're exposed to um, the truth and unchanged uh, the worse state we are in spiritually uh, we studied this last night with uh, reading of jones there mm -hmm. uh, that, uh, you know, the worst condition to be in is to know the truth, but not live the truth. Somebody who doesn't know the truth and, you know, is unconverted is not as bad a shape as somebody who knows the truth and is unconverted. Because he already knows what he needs to do to be converted. Um, so it's, it's not going to have any effect upon him. He already has had that light and rejected it. So it's um, it's it's what we've been reading about in five testimonies, all through five testimonies. This is basically the message Ellen White is giving. Exactly. But isn't it interesting how? I mean, I I had no idea what was said last night. I mean, I there were other things that were taking my my time. Mm -hmm. And yet our Heavenly Father is repeating and reinforcing the very lessons that, that you were presenting last night. Mm -hmm. 
So when this, when this type of admonition occurs, should we not heed it? Should we not pay attention? Mm -hmm. So, brothers and sisters, if you were unable, as I was, to attend last night's meeting, I would suggest that we all need to take time to listen to what was being presented, because much of that is going to be important. And in answer to the question in the chat, is there a PDF of the document being read? Um, there will be a PDF, I believe, that we'll be able to send out later today. This question is a serious one, and it should be fully entered into and its meaning realized. Men may be members of a church. Apparently, they may work religiously, performing a round of prescribed duties from year to year and still remain unconverted. There are those who write in regard to religious matters, but although they delight to do this work in defense of Christianity, they may yet be unconverted. A man may preach pleasing, entertaining sermons, but he may be far from Christ as regards to genuine experience. He may be self-sufficient and exalted to the pinnacle of greatness, yet never have experienced the inward work of grace that should form the character. Such a one is deceived by his connection and familiarity with the sacred truths of the gospel, which have reached the intellect, but have gone no deeper. The truth has not been brought into the inner sanctuary of the soul. Brothers and sisters, what is being referred to here of the inner sanctuary of the soul? Are we not to be living stones? Are we not to be part of the temple constructed without hands? Are we not in practice to be living expositories of the message of Revelation 14? And if so, does that not mean that we should be living our lives similar to the courtyard, accepting of and within our lives the message of the holy place and at our core being very much like the most holy place? Yes, I would agree that the word brought into the daily practical life and living is going to be necessary. By his conscience, every honest Jew was convinced that Jesus Christ was the Son of God, but the heart in its pride and ambition would not surrender. Is this what we are seeing today within the movement and within the church? that our hearts have not surrendered. An opposition was maintained against the light of truth, which they had decided to resist and deny. When the truth is held as truth only by the conscience, when the heart is not stimulated and made receptive, the truth only agitates the mind. But when the truth is received as truth by the heart, it has passed through the conscience and captivated the soul by its pure principles. It is placed in the heart by the Holy Spirit who molds its beauty to the mind that its transforming power may be seen in the character. Is this not the type of promise that we should be able to hold on to, that this is being placed in the heart by the Holy Spirit, and then we allow the Holy Spirit to mold this beauty to the mind 
so that the transforming power can be seen in the character. Now, the question that was asked in the chat, what does it mean to practically surrender one's heart? Is it the same as giving your will to the Lord? What would you say, brothers and sisters? How do we approach that? Yes, I would. With with me, I have to ask the Lord to make me willing to be willing to be broken and to yield to him and to be guided by him. Okay. Well, you know, because sometimes this can be a little bit abstract, you know, things like, like giving your heart to Christ or surrendering. Um, I think with Jones, what, what he shows is that um, a knowledge of Christ is, is what, what really initiates this whole thing. And, and even that can be a little bit abstract, is what do we know, what do we understand about Christ? So as we study the scriptures, we, we come to see Christ, we come to behold him in some way. That is, light shines in the darkness, and we have to respond to that light. And so we don't look to ourselves for righteousness, right? We know that we have to cooperate with Christ in the work that he wants to do in our lives. We have to open the door of the heart, all these different sort of illustrations. Um, but it's, it's really a knowledge of who Christ is, of his character, that becomes this motivating power. Um, so, I mean, there's a practical, the practical part is yoking up with Christ, seeking to obey God, um, the life of self-sacrifice, you know, self being crucified. These things cannot be done by us because they're done by Christ first. Like we can't sacrifice ourselves. You can't crucify yourself. But we are crucified in Christ. Um, so Jones, you know, he keeps trying to bring this point home. But I think often it, it evades us because we're focusing upon what we are doing as far as, as you know, living by sight and not learning to trust God's uh, power in our lives. So we, we, we want to see it happening. So, I mean, it's true, you know, that we have to, the word has to be brought daily into practical life and living. Yet that's, you know, that's not often easy to discern. A person can deceive themselves because of their intellect that they are converted. But we need to see ourselves as sinners. We don't need to see ourselves as converted, if that makes sense. Because people can believe they're converted. They can see themselves as converted when they're not. So, so our, our role is to see ourselves as unconverted. I hope that that makes sense. Okay. We received a response there in the chat. Thanking you for, for the explanation. <clears throat> now, unless a man is renewed in the spirit of his mind by the transforming power of the Holy Spirit, he will become restless and dissatisfied because he has not died to self. Come unto me, said Christ, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly of heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Matthew eleven twenty eight to 30. Again, Christ said, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Without me, 
he can do nothing correctly any more than could Cain. Of what advantage is any system of religion to one who has not been transformed in character by the profession of faith without works? So, okay, in the chat, John 3, 8. It states, I agree that conversion to Christ-likeness is a process and the human will is very much involved in cooperating with Christ. Any other thought to that? Well, just with this verse here, because we looked at this last night uh, in A.T. Jones, uh, dealing with the meekness and lowliness of Christ, learning of his meekness and lowliness. And, you know, again, we know that the transforming power uh, can be seen in the character. Right. That right. we know there is this transformation of character that occurs when a person is converted. But we don't look for that. We don't find our peace through seeing ourselves transformed. Right. We can have peace with God, even though we see ourselves as sinners. Because we're depending upon Christ. That is, the righteousness that gives us peace is the righteousness in Christ. Um, so, you know, when we say Christ-likeness is a process, we you know uh, what we're not looking for is we're not looking for our, our peace does not come from seeing our advancement in the Christian life. Our peace comes from Christ revealing more and more of our sin and us depending more, more upon him. So if we, we depend upon him, that's where our peace comes from. You know, when, when we first come to Christ, we experience peace, right? When we confess our sins, we come to him, we, we confess our sins, we see that we're a sinner, and we ask him to take over our lives and we will experience peace. But have we seen our lives up to that point as perfect? You know, obviously not. Right. Right. But we can still have peace. But sometimes we get in our mind that, you know, now that we're Christians, that we need to see our lives as progressing in order to have peace. And what we do is we delude ourselves. We actually wander farther away from God. Right? We, we build up in our mind this imagination that we are converted because we believe the truth. But Ellen White says, unless a man is renewed in the spirit of his mind by the transforming power of the Holy Spirit, he will become restless and dissatisfied because he has not died to self. And this restlessness and dissatisfaction leads us deeper into sin, right? That's why people seek the world. It's instead of seeking Christ to find rest, right? We seek the things of the world to find rest. We keep chasing after this this thing that's really unattainable. You can't have rest from sin unless you rest in Christ. Exactly. No one who believes the truth will live a selfish, self-pleasing life. For the truth is everlasting, refining, and sanctifying in its influence. The true minister of the gospel will not stand before the people to speak smooth words, to cry peace and safety. He realizes the dangers that threaten the soul. He presents the truth as it is in Jesus. The truth comes from his lips, clear, plain, and decided, as though he fully believed the words spoken to be a savor of life unto life, 
or of death unto death. He knows that he has the spirit and the power of God. His words will awaken the conscience of the hearers. The lessons given by the greatest teacher the world ever knew were given in plain, simple language. Christ's words were explicit and direct. His words were given line upon line and precept upon precept. This should be our example. While cheerfulness, hope, and faith in through Jesus should be expressed, nothing should be said to create mirth. This, I think, is a very specific admonition. Now, I need to step away for just a moment. Could you continue for a bit, Theodore? I'll be right read it? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Make a practical application of the truth. Urge the truth home with directness and present the high standard that God sets before his people. Truth must become truth to the receiver of to the receiver to all intents and purposes. It must be stamped on the heart. With the heart, man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. Romans ten ten. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. Mark. 2030. This is the service God receives. Nothing short of this is pure and undefiled religion. The heart is the citadel of the being, and until that is wholly on the Lord's side, the enemy will gain constant victories over us through his subtle temptations. So here again, we have this word practical, a practical application of the truth. Now, what's the what's the root of the word practical? What does that mean? Practical. Something we can put to good use, apply it to our lives. Well, so it's practice, right? Practicing something, right? Putting it into action, right? So, so putting something into action, that is, we, we have the truth, and we need to walk in the truth. We have the light, we need to walk in the light. We have to take action. Now it says, make a practical application of the truth. That is, we need to bring the truth to people so that they can see how to bring it into action. Right. So she says, urge the truth home with directness. And present the high standard that God sets before his people. So, so we had a, a study yesterday afternoon um, in, in the building that I used to live in. And, you know, the lady there is going through some, some difficult trials that, that we study with. And, um, you know, what I presented to her was a fairly high standard. I mean, much higher than she's... She's presently living. And, um, and yet she finds that attractive because she knows, and she has some good biblical knowledge, but she knows that she's not living up to the standards that God has. Even though there are, there are things in her life she's not willing at this point to yield. As you present this high standard and this person takes these steps to meet those that standard because they see it as desirable. That's something that's practical. You put before people something that is practical, not just something theoretical. It's easy for me to do theoretical stuff, you know, all kinds of, you know, chronology and things, but there has to be a practical uh, application of those things. Right? So truth must become truth to the receiver. That is, what does it mean that truth becomes truth to the receiver, to all intents and purposes? It's something, it becomes light. Um, 
Okay, so we have a comment here dealing, I find appetite is the biggest challenge of being practical, not eating several hours before sleep. It sometimes feels like cutting off the arm. It's a battle and a march living up to the light given. Um, and of course that's true about all sin. Um, I mean, I know that appetite is something that becomes really um, evident Right. If we can't control our appetite, whatever type of appetite that is, if we can't stop from doing something, we have a desire to do something. And sometimes things that in and of themselves are bad, like eating is not a bad thing to do. Um, but to to not eat when we we know it's not the best time to eat, that can be difficult. So, um, you know, the question is. You know, how do we overcome appetite? You know, our motives, the reasons why we're trying to do something. Um, you know, are, are really the main part of it. We have to give our will to God. We have to we have these struggles to do. So there's nothing where you can say, well, you shouldn't struggle with appetite. You know, just get to know God better. There's these types of theories out there. But the reality is um, we struggle with sin. We struggle with self. And that struggle is always to be there. Okay, Dwight, um, yes. read the next part. Or do you have some comments on that? Just listening to what you were, what you were saying. Okay. Nicely presented. If the life is given into its control, the power of truth is unlimited. What, what an example this is giving us. So if life is given into the control of God, then the power of the truth. Yeah, that's true. What? is unlimited. The thoughts are brought into captivity to Jesus Christ. From the treasure of the heart are brought forth appropriate and fitting words, especially should our words be guarded. Writing to Timothy, Paul says, hold fast the form of sound words, which thou hast heard of me, in faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. That good thing which was committed unto thee, keep by the Holy Spirit, which dwelleth in us. Second Timothy 1, 13 and 14. All that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecutions, he says again. Second Timothy 3, 12. But this should not intimidate one's soul. What can give such sunshine to the soul as the evidence of sins forgiven? What can impart true nobility if it is not the restoration of the moral image of God in man? From whence can peace come to the soul if not from the Prince of Peace? To what source can we look for help but to him who can give us light in the midst of darkness. Mrs. White has spoken multiple times how the image of God had been being erased from humanity. Yet here we are given this, that it is the moral image of God that is being ruined and is being replaced. So if this true nobility is necessary, should we not be accepting that we have a great need to be restored to properly represent God and his character to this world.
Christ has promised to send us the comforter whose work it is to establish the kingdom of God in the soul. Amid the abundant provisions of mercy, grace, and peace, which have been made, why do human beings act as though they entertain the idea that the truth is a yoke of bondage? Is it because the heart has never tasted and seen the Lord is good? The soul that cherishes the love of Christ is full of freedom, of light, and joy in Christ. In such a soul, there are no divided thoughts. The whole man yearns after God. Now, what does it mean to you to say the whole man yearns after God? Think of this. Consider this today. He goes not to men for counsel to know what is duty, but to the Lord Jesus, the source of all wisdom. He searches the word of God that he may find out what standard has been set up. Can we ever find a surer guide than the Lord Jesus? True religion is embodied in the word of God and consists in being under the guidance of the Holy One in thought in word and in deed. He who is the way, the truth, and the life takes the humble, earnest, wholehearted seeker and says, follow me. He leads him in the narrow way to holiness in heaven. Christ has opened this way for us at great cost to himself. We are not left to stumble our way along in darkness. Jesus is at our right hand proclaiming, I am the way. <clears throat> All who decide to follow the Lord fully will be led in the royal path, yea, more the divine path, cast up for the ransom of the Lord to walk in. Now, if we are being led in the royal path, And if this is the, the equivalent of the divine path, then what other path is there? And this is the path that Christ has gone before. Right. He, he's made a way in this path. That is the narrow path, the royal path, the divine path. It's not possible for man to choose and go this way on his own. Men in this age of the world act as if they are at liberty to question the words of God, of the infinite, to review his decisions and his statutes endorsing, revising, reshaping, and annulling at their pleasure. Brothers and sisters, are we in any manner to attempt to change the word of God? No, we are not. Do we have the power to decide what laws we are to keep and what laws we are not to keep. Negative. If they cannot misconstrue, misinterpret, and alter God's plain decision, or bend and manipulate it to please the multitude and to please themselves, they choose to break it. We are never safe while we are guided by human opinions, but we are safe when we are guided by a thus saith the Lord. We cannot trust the salvation of our soul to any lower standard than the decision of an infallible judge. Those who make God their guide and his word their counselor, behold the lamp of life. God's living oracles guide their feet 
and the feet of all who are willing to be led in straight paths. Those who are thus led do not dare to judge the word of God, but ever hold that his word judges them. They get their faith and their religion from the word of the living God. It is the guide and the counselor that directs their path. This word is indeed a light to their feet and a lamp to their path. They walk under the direction of the father of light, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. He whose tender mercies are over all his works makes the path of the just as a shining light which shineth more and more unto the perfect day. So what is our responsibility here? What are we to be doing this day? Are we to be trusting in theories of others? No. Are we to be trusting in a plane, thus saith the Lord? Yes. It says we're supposed to walk under the direction of the Father of life. Okay. The teacher of truth must practice the truth that he communicates to the people. Else his labor will be in vain. Converted messengers of the Most High are needed to voice the word of God to the people. Those who support the word of truth, not only by argument, by, but by living the truth, range themselves on the side of righteousness. By a converted life, they give evidence that they bear the solemn message of warning, which is a savor of life unto life or death unto death. When men are really converted, controversy and debate will be ended. The plain standing truth will be proclaimed by lips that have been touched with a live coat, coal from the altar of God. So what is the challenge that is being given to us in this paragraph? Well, practice the things that you preach. Okay. Exactly. So, does that mean that we can preach to others? You need to change your diet on this and then decide that we're not going to accept those admonitions within our own lives? Well, it would include that, but I think the much more subtle things okay. are, you know, have to do with how we treat one another. Amen. Well, those are much more difficult, you know. Uh, I, I mean, not, nothing against, you know, changing diets and overcoming appetite, because those things are important. Um, but those things are not evidence that we are converted even right right so so there are many people who eat a strict you know diet hygienic diet and who have overcome their appetite uh for you know animal meat um but they're still have no problem um uh being a cannibal when it comes to their brethren You can strain at a gnat, but swallow a camel. Exactly. So, so that's, you know, it's, you know, how we treat one another, how we approach the truth. This has been the big struggle for this movement because we all consider ourselves to be orthodox in our thinking. that we, we know the truth and we understand the truth. But to, to trust that God is in charge and that, that, that he his truth is going to carry through 
that, that we, in a sense, aren't needed individually. Um, if you understand what I'm saying, I mean, obviously God wants us, but sometimes we put ourselves ahead of the truth, our own pride, our own opinions, and and we end up being cruel to our brethren. And even though we may have control of our appetite, at least in our minds. But I think so, that's, that, that's the major point in yeah. our own minds. Yeah. You know, when men are really converted, controversy and debate will be ended. Now, you could look at this two different ways. You can just say, well, all men are converted. and Now they're not going to have any controversy or debate. Which, which is probably what she means, I, I think, largely. You know, that if, if we were converted, we're not going to have these problems. Um, but also just from an individual point of view, if you're really converted, you're going to approach uh, disagreements with your brethren in, in a much different manner than if you're unconverted. Because pride is not going to be a part of that discussion. At least from, from your point of view, right? From, from your side of things. And you have an opportunity to reach others um, in that way. So, I mean, I know often, and, and, and this is you know sort of a controversial situation, but... Um, you know, sometimes we we think the other person is proud, uh, but actually we're the ones that are proud. We've deceived ourselves. We think because somebody uh, holds a different view than us and won't be persuaded, we can think, well, well <laughs> that person's pretty stubborn. He's pretty proud. And yet... The problem is actually us, and we can easily deceive ourselves in this way. We all have done it. Yep, we have. From what I understand, it's we're to learn how to approach men so we can deliver the message without it being a controversy. Mm -hmm. That's what we seek to do. I mean, you can never you know, change other people, but you definitely have an opportunity to change yourself. Well, there's where it comes to the character of Christ that comes in to play mm -hmm. at that point. If it's coming mm -hmm. into your life, which is what this is actually for. This, all this information, all this, all these books, all these lines of evidence is, is for the individual. It's not for the, the, mm -hmm. for the whole church uh, to you know beat people over the head with it's it's each person comes into this conversion and then they are at that point they think can become more effective and have that character that is so um, uh, so much desired to have yeah yeah because if I take this counsel here and I just think yeah this applies to brother so and so or sister so and so and that's as far as it goes, then it's been preached to deaf ears. Right. But one of the one of the points that I would I would offer for consideration. We are the church. We are the movement. We are supposed to be the body of Christ. In the body of Christ, the right arm disagreeing with the left leg does not help the body. We are to consider our needs so that we may see that we have a greater need of Christ 
one of the points that that my mother has often said is the faults you see in others are the ones you most need to correct in yourselves. Now, she would say that to me, especially when, when my brother and I would be fighting. And the things that annoy you most about others. Yes. You know, the things that, that those are the things you have to really take a long, hard look at of why those things annoy you. Well, what is it about you? Not what is it about the other person? Because our natural thing is somebody really annoys us. Well, that person has this problem. The question is, why am I so annoyed? Right. God gives to every man his word. And with the imparted commission, he gives to his messengers a measure of power proportionate to their faith. He is constantly unfolding to the heart the riches of his grace. Light will shine forth in clear, bright rays from those who receive the light from the word of God. Now, what did Christ tell us about the faith of a mustard seed? That it grows up to a big tree. Did he also not tell us that if we, if we have faith, if we have true faith, we could say to that mountain, move. Or am I, am I misapplying this? No, you're right. So what does that say about the power that is proportionate to our faith today? Do we even have the faith of the size of a mustard seed when we are given a measure of power proportionate to our faith? Where did Christ find the greatest faith in Israel? In a Roman soldier. What does that say to us today? <laughs> Is he going to find faith within this movement? If he was to come today? God gives to every man his word, and with the imparted commission, he gives to his messengers a measure of power proportionate to their faith. What kind of faith do we have right now? Consider this today. God calls upon his people to reveal him. Shall the world manifest principles of integrity that the church does not maintain? Shall a selfish ambition be first be shown by the followers of Christ? Shall not the principles cherished by them be unselfish laid upon the true foundation, even Christ Jesus? What material shall we place upon this precious foundation that there may be no longer be antagonism but unity within the church shall what shall we build shall worthless material be laid upon this precious foundation shall we bring it to wood hay and stubble shall we not rather bring the most precious material gold silver and precious stones Shall we not distinguish sharply between the chaff and the wheat? Shall we not realize that we must receive the Holy Spirit in our hearts, that it may mold and fashion the practical life? Shall we not strive to discern the divinity and the atonement of Christ? 
What do you think about that, about that passage? What do you think she is saying to us right here? She continues, we have the truth. Shall we not practice its living principles? So this is, this is bluntly presented. These are living principles. We must practice the truth in our daily lives. Selfishness is the great evil that makes of none effect the preaching of the cross of Christ. Preach the word, not antidotes. Anecdotes. Anecdotes. Yeah. Stories. My, right. Yeah. So there's, you know, and that's a lot of preaching is anecdotes. I mean, you, you, even on uh, eSword, they have this book you can get, which is, you know, anecdotes that you can use in sermons. But to preach the word, I mean, anecdotes, they don't have the same power as God's word. For God's sake, for Christ's sake, do not drown the word, the voice of Christ by your own interpretation of the scriptures. Do not make the word of God mean what he never meant it to mean. I don't know that I've ever read a paragraph from her that was so bluntly presented. Mm -hmm. the Holy Spirit must work on the hearts of the teachers of God's word that they may give the truth to the people in the clear pure way that Christ himself gave the truth he revealed it not only in his words but in his practice if God's messengers realize the necessity of the Holy Spirit's working this spirit will speak through them to the heart, to the hearers. They will understand the meaning of the truth spoken. Lie low, my brethren, lie low, if you would appreciate the Holy Spirit's working upon the mind and upon the heart. Christ reproached his disciples with their slowness, slowness of comprehension. Why did they not understand his lessons? Because his words did not agree with what they had been taught in the past or with their hopes and their expectations. Well, that was with the great many of the disciples and, and well, even the Jews themselves, they didn't, they didn't get it. He was going over the same stuff um, that they had, been presented 1200 years or so before and up to that point right but uh, they had worked in their own their own little um, services to replace whatever it is you know to make a, a stepping stone upward which is which isn't there Okay. The priests and the rulers taught for doctrines the commandments of men. I think that goes right in line with what you were just saying. Are we to put our view, our word above that of God's? No. No, we're not. Okay. Christ tried to impress his disciples that he had left in their possession truths of which they did not comprehend the value. After his resurrection, he said to them, these are the things which I spake unto you while I was yet with you. Then opened he their understanding 
that they might understand the scriptures, Luke 24, 44, and 45. Now, are we to have Christ to open up our understanding at this time? Are we not to search the scriptures, the spirit of prophecy, as a miner searching for gold? Well, that's been the that's been the major motivation for the last few well years. So here. Mrs. White says the following. Brethren, we are living in perilous times. What time are we living in right now? What would we call this time? Perilous times. Is this not the time of the end? Oh, yeah. If it is the time of the end, we know that the history of this world is soon to conclude. In the fear of God, I tell you that the true exposition of the scriptures is necessary for the correct moral development of our characters. When heart and mind are worked by the Holy Spirit, when self is dead, the truth is capable of constant expansion and new development. When the truth as it is in Jesus molds our characters, it will be seen to be truth indeed. As it is contemplated by the true believer, it will grow brighter, shining in its original beauty. As we behold it, it will increase in value, brightening in its own natural loveliness, quickening and vivifying the mind, subduing our selfish, unchristlike coarseness of character. It will elevate our aspirations, enabling us to reach the perfect standard of holiness. We have yet to learn that the whole Jewish economy is a compacted prophecy of the gospel. It is the gospel in figures. From the pillar of cloud, Christ himself presented the duty of man to his fellow men. In Christ's words to his appointed agencies, both in the Old Testament and in the New, the Christian virtues are, proper, are plainly brought out. Christ scattered the precious grains of truth through all his teaching. All will find them to be as precious pearls, rich in value, if they will practice the principles plainly laid down. The Old Testament is the ground where practical godliness was first sown. This was repeated in Christ's words to his disciples. So if the Old Testament is the gospel in figures, if the Old Testament is figurative representation of the gospel itself, do we have any right to set it, its laws or its admonitions aside? No, I, think no. You're, I didn't quite understand that question, but um, I think no. How many times do we find that there are those that wish to rely strictly upon the New Testament and set aside the Old Testament? Well, that's a whole lot of people. Here I think we are. I was in the line at one time too. Okay. Here we are being told that the Old Testament is the ground where practical godliness was first sown. 
the Old Testament was preparing this field, was preparing hearts for the seed that would be sown, as we are shown, that the Jews that were true in heart were the ones that came to accept Christ and grow in Christ, that there were many that heard and understood the relevance of what Christ was teaching, but because of their pride, they set it aside. Our lack of faith, the absence of the love and respect that is due to all the children of God, detracts from our influence and makes our labors of none effect. When the power of the Holy Spirit is appreciated and felt in the heart, far less of self will be exhibited and far more of the feeling of human brotherhood revealed that is seen in the tenderness of Christ. Our work is not to exhibit self, but to let the Holy Spirit work within us. Thus, self-deceived men and women may be rescued from their delusion. Okay, now, there's a comment in the chat. Why would you say this? Why would I say it? Because everything we're doing is based on the entire word of God. I mean, or should be. And uh, to abandon that, it's, it's like cutting off your own feet. You've got nothing to stand on. And yet I still remember so distinctly when I was first coming coming into this movement. I mean, I didn't even know F FFA was extant until I went to my first camp meeting. It was all a whole new world for me. And yet instinctively, I knew it was the truth and I needed to pursue it. And uh, I, I brought some of the some of the information home and showed it to some some of the some, some of the elders and they were so dismissive of it. Oh, that's what we used used to believe. Oh, that goes back to Millerite times. You know, just so blase about everything. And I was just appalled. Like that was a, such a wake up call for me. And I thought, well, as usual, I'm going to have to study on my own because I'm not going to get fed by these guys and neither is anybody else. I would agree. If we are not willing to study for ourselves, if we are not willing to spend the time to investigate for ourselves, how will we ever be able to give the final warning message? I cannot forbear to tell you in the name of the Lord that you are not on safe ground unless the truth with its living principles teaches you your danger, bringing you every day closer to Christ in character. Many supposed conversions are talked of and published, which cannot stand the stress of trial and of temptation. Under difficulty, the test of God's word reveals them to be faithless, envious, jealous, full of evil surmisings. Many, many are stony ground hearers. They have no depth of spiritual experience. They do not apply the truth to their hearts and to their consciences. Self in its unsanctified elements is alive, revealing attributes which strengthen evil in the place of repressing it. Self is not crucified. There is a lack of pure tone piety, and this lack makes them weaklings in the army of the Lord, where when they might be giants 
if they were willing to be converted to the truth. True conversion is divine and yieldeth peaceable fruits of righteousness. Now, <clears throat> these multiple paragraphs that we've read so far have a huge import for what we are going to be able to study in this coming week. Those that have received the email with Zechariah 4 will find part of this document having been in this, especially in relation to Zechariah 4, verse 6. This document is being presented to help us understand what we are going to be discussing in reference to this one particular verse that Mrs. White chose to wrote, write upon multiple times. Now, we are coming to the close of our time together. I know we've had a shortened time because of the issues that I faced this morning. But do we have any other questions or comments for what we have read today? Well, the thing that strikes me the most here in this last paragraph, self in its unsanctified elements is alive, revealing right. attributes which strengthen evil in the place of repressing it. Self is not crucified. And so, I mean, that's the thing that we have to face in our lives. That, that all of these things that we study, the focus is to reveal to us this truth. Isn't it kind of interesting as we look at this, that we're being required to look at ourselves and to look at ourselves as others would see us. We're having to face our own defects of characters at this time. We are supposed to be looking into the mirror, aren't we? Mm -hmm. But that mirror that we're being asked to look at is Christ's character. Yeah, but I don't know about you. I, I see myself. I don't see Christ. But yet we are to be able to look into a mirror to see ourselves as Christ would see us in comparison with his character. Right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm, I, myself personally, I, I, I can't confess that. You know, I am that righteousness. Uh, I mean, even though I do a lot of the stuff that he wants me to do, there's there's a lot of stuff that, you know, I'm like unwilling to do. I, I think, I feel that I'm unwilling to do. Okay. Let us consider this until the next time we meet. Let us prepare for this Sabbath so that we may understand what Christ is expecting of us at this time. Shall we now close in prayer? Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for the many blessings that you have provided. We thank you for this time that we have been able to spend together today in conversation and consideration of that which your prophet has presented. Be with us now. Help us and guide us so that we may walk with you in spirit and in truth. For this, Father, we ask. For this, we praise you and thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.